You know, at Clear Creek Church of Christ, we do one thing. We find people who don't know Jesus and we bring them into a life-changing relationship with him. And over the past six months, you've heard me talking about on-ramps to our church. And these on-ramps represent new creative ways for people who are seeking Jesus to come in contact with the church family here at Clear Creek. Uh, the leadership team has decided, based partially on your feedback, uh, that our first step should not be a new on-ramp, but to add a lane to our existing on-ramp, which is Sunday morning worship. Right now, we're in the middle of Vision 2020, and if you're not familiar with Vision 2020, a few years ago, we set this vision that by the year 2020, we would have just as many people here that have a history of being unchurched or de-churched, which uh, maybe grew up in church and left, uh, as those who have been church their entire lives. And, and we're truly, really trying to reach that goal. And as church leaders, we're very aware that we'll never reach that mission uh, unless, or that vision, unless we can find ways to have every member of the Clear Creek family on mission. And, and so on mission really is the mindset that people need to know Jesus and that the Clear Creek family is God's plan A in this community for that to happen. Being on mission is not easy. It's not convenient and it's not comfortable. It requires flexibility, faith, and dedication to the Great Commission. And it means personally becoming second to a calling that's much larger than we are. So the first step in that direction uh, will be adding additional Sunday morning service, and it will be a 9 a.m. service, and it will begin on August the 21st. Over the next several weeks, we'll be sharing much more information about how this is all gonna be rolled out, and also what we need for you to do in order to help us be on mission as a church to reach our community. However, before we do this, we wanna ask you to do two things, okay? And this is over the next seven days, two things. First, over the next seven days, spend some time every day praying about our church and about reaching this community and about this effort in particular, opening up this new uh, service. Pray for God to bless it, for him to show us what we need to do, what our role will be in it, and also that uh, a lot of people will come to him and get to know Jesus uh, because of the work at Clear Creek. And number two, and Jake has already talked about this, we wanna ask everybody to come next Sunday night uh, to hear Scott Sager. He'll be here to make a presentation entitled, The First Question, Will This Make Disciples? And the leadership team heard, this, heard him present this at another location recently, and, and we feel it's the most compelling presentation that we've heard on the subject of making disciples, and it's the best explanation uh, possible of why we're gonna be doing some of the things that you're gonna hear over the next few weeks. And so please be here for that. So after that's over, after this presentation, we're gonna begin the implementation stage uh, of adding this service, and we'll be calling on our members to worship one, serve one. You'll hear that phrase quite a bit, where we'll want you to come worship and then also serve in, in the next service. So. Uh, however, we'll not be sharing a lot of logistics and things like that right now. We want to get to this first week of prayer, and we want you to hear this lesson first. So, before you ask questions, before you decide how it affects you, before uh, all of that, please be prayerful, and please be here next Sunday night, because you're going to be really glad that you did. So, we'll hope you'll, you'll do that. So, once again, we're, we're in the process of rolling out a new service, and I can't wait to see what God's going to do with that. It's, it's an exciting time for us at Clear Creek, and not just that, we've got other announcements that will be coming up that's going to be exciting as well. So, before that, or, or now that we're at the uh, time for our speaker, uh, we've started doing something this year we've never done before. We're calling them C4 Sundays, and if you don't know what C4 stands for, it stands for Clear Creek Church of Christ, so that's C4. And uh, we, we're wanting to bring in speakers that are nationally known speakers who, who uh, really bring something that we ordinarily may not be getting. And, and we wanted to bring in Randy Harris today to be our speak, first speaker for a C4 Sunday. Randy is the CBS spiritual director at Abilene Christian University. He's part of the, the Bible teaching faculty there. He grew up in Bentonville, Arkansas, which, uh, sorry Randy, but the most famous thing to come out of Bentonville, Arkansas is not Randy Harris, but Walmart. And, uh, but he, he came from there, he graduated from Harding, got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree from Harding, also holds a master's degree in philosophy from Syracuse University in New York. And he taught at Lipscomb for 10 years. Uh, he has been teaching at Abilene Christian for more than 15 years, is that right? And he has preached at uh, the um, uh, South 11th and Willis Street Church of Christ 
in Abilene. He uh, was a preacher at Donaldson when I first met him in Nashville. And uh, now he's a, a member of the Highland Church of Christ in Abilene, Texas. Uh, I want to ask you to come up. Randy, be making your way up here. Uh, we're very blessed to have Randy here. He's got a book out if you haven't read it yet. It's called God Work, Confessions of a Stand-Up Theologian. So uh, I, I haven't read it yet either, and I, I'm looking for it on my Kindle, so it's going to be my next read. Randy, we're so glad you're here, and we want to pray over you before you begin sharing God's Word with us this morning. So if you would, let's, let's all pray. God, our Father, we are so grateful for Randy and the gift that you've given him and his willingness to use it and all the lives that he's touched because uh, of his obedience to you. And, and Father, we can't wait to see how you're going to work through him this morning. Uh, bless him and, and give him the, the strength and, and the presence of mind to, to present your word in a way that is going to truly touch our hearts. Father, we cannot wait to see what you're going to do in this assembly, uh, not because of anything that we do, but because of the amazing power of your spirit. And Father, we pray that you'll work through this lesson in amazing ways. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Randy. Uh, by the way, it's far more important that you buy the book than that you actually read it. Okay. Some, some, some people are trying to change the world. I'm just trying to get a new couch. Uh, um, I'm going to try to do uh, uh, one thing uh, today. I'm going to try to listen carefully to a text of the Bible. And as we listen to it carefully, you're going to walk out of here today with a little lighter step. That's what I intend to do. Uh, I teach uh, preaching, among other things. Uh, this is beginning preachers. Uh, Mitch did not take this class, have you noticed? Uh, um, and some Tuesday nights, I listen to five first sermons. Think about that. I listen to five sermons from people who have never preached a sermon before in their life. Um, some of you, when you die, are going to go to purgatory. I have already done it. <laughs> and we try to answer such weighty questions as, how many points should a sermon have? And the answer to that question is, let's try for one. Um, and I kind of have this deal with my class. If, if somebody in the class uh, does something that I find uh, particularly interesting, I will try somehow to incorporate that into a sermon I sometime preach on the road, and then I'll let them know that, and they can see what I did with their idea. It's my way of paying homage uh, to them or stealing, it all depends on your, your point of view on that. And uh, I had a student who, who had this image that really did uh, strike me, and so I'm gonna pay homage to him by starting out with this image, and then we're going to listen very carefully to Colossians chapter two, and we're gonna walk out of here with a little lighter step. Uh, this is the story that he told me. Well, maybe I should start it with a question. How many of you uh, parents have ever been in a household where someone was trying to learn a musical instrument? Raise your hand. Okay, so you've had that purgatorial experience as well. Um, this, um, this particular uh, young preacher was a musician. Uh, he was a violin player. And he was telling the story about uh, being in a youth symphony and they're trying to learn some particularly difficult piece of music. Let's say it's a Mahler symphony and they're not really getting it right. And, and so the conductor gives them this little um, part of the music, tells them, I want you to go home and play it until you can play it perfectly. When you can play it perfectly, record it and hand it in for a grade. So the violin player goes home and now maybe you're imagining your son or daughter and starts to learn the piece of music. He's playing, 
but it's hard, and he can't get it right, and he's getting frustrated, and he plays again, and, and this is a little bit like uh, those of us who actually had to write term papers in school before computers, raise your hand if you remember doing that, you feel like you almost got a page done, and then your footnotes won't fit. And he's playing along, and he thinks, I've got this piece licked, and then he gets to the end, and he makes mistakes, and he's got to start all over, and he's almost howling in frustration, tears running down his face, and he can't get it right. Finally, about midnight, mom comes in and says, what are you doing? And he says, I've been playing this same piece of music over and over and over again, and she says, I know. And he said, I just cannot get it right. And finally he plays it one more time and hands it in, gets a B minus. That story had a way of sort of creeping under my skin because it struck me that that's the way a lot of us do our Christianity. God's given us this music and it's really hard and we're trying to play it and we're trying to get it right, but we keep messing it up and when we hand it in, God gives us a B minus. It's a hard way to do life. And then I got this other picture in my mind. That same violin player. Eyes closed, concentrating on the music playing the music, occasionally hitting a clunker, but keeps playing, gets to the end, plays again. Mom comes in around midnight and says, what are you doing? And he says, I've been playing this music. I've been playing it over and over and over. And she says, I know. He says, sit down, you gotta hear this. And she says, I have. And he says, no, 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 sit down, you gotta hear this. And she sits down and he starts to play, eyes closed in concentration, a little tear rolling down the cheek as he plays, hits a clunker every once in a while, but keeps playing, gets to the end and says, even with the clunkers, that music is some kind of beautiful, isn't it? She says, yeah, it's beautiful. And if you looked in the window at just the right time and saw both violin players, you might think they were having the same experience, but they are radically different experiences. One trying so hard not to make a mistake and the other playing along with the beauty of the music. Now we're ready to hear the text. In Colossians chapter 2, Paul is writing to a church where people are afraid. Uh, I want to show you a couple of pictures of uh, one of my favorite places in the world. Uh, this is Angkor Wat in uh, Siprim, Cambodia. Uh, there's another uh, picture where you can uh, see it. It is, in my estimation, one of the creepiest places on earth. Uh, now, Siem Reap is, uh, uh, well, let's just put it this way. Anchor Wat now attracts a lot of tourists. There is a hard rock cafe in Siem Reap, Cambodia. But even with all of the people around, I assure you, it's a very creepy place. And if you go back to the first picture for a moment, uh, this Angkor Wat complex is probably the single largest building in the history of the world ever dedicated to religious purposes. It's a thousand years old. And the people who built it uh, weren't textual people. They didn't leave us lots of, of texts. In fact, they didn't leave us any. And so we gotta try to figure things out other ways what what was this building about and the biggest theory right now is this no one lived there no one worshiped there it was built to be a palace for the gods especially Shiva 
the destroyer of worlds. What would make people do all the work that it took to build a building like that a thousand years ago that no one ever really went into? I don't know about you, but I'll tell you my leading candidate. Fear is what makes you do that. Because if there is any God that you want to keep happy, it's Shiva, the destroyer of worlds. So we build this palace. And you think, oh, okay, we don't, uh, we don't believe in that stuff anymore. But here's what you do believe in. You believe in the dark powers. And today, Memorial Day in Chattanooga, of all places, you believe in the dark powers. You know that there are the powers of darkness and night that work around the world. And unless you've just been asleep for the last two or three years, there have been probably moments when you, like me, feel like we are going under. The world's not going to make it. We are going to plunge God's good creation into eternal night because the powers of darkness are so strong in this world. Which brings me to Colossians 2. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. So, then just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. I want to pause just for a moment that phrase the basic principles of this world is a Greek word the Greek word is stoikeion and the stoikeion are the fearsome powers out there that we can't control the stoikeion are what people what causes people to build anchor what stoikeion are those powers that we're still afraid of that might overwhelm the world in darkness That's what they're afraid of. For in Christ, the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith and the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that are to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen, and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle reasons. He has lost his connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the stoikeion, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. 
Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Paul says to the people in Colossae, Jesus Christ has triumphed over all the powers of darkness. So why aren't you living like that? You're acting like people who are scared to death. You keep acting like somehow you've got to get control of the dark powers. And so this is what you do. You say, okay, what we need is a little more church in our lives. Let's go to church more and maybe we'll be able to push the stoike on away. Or maybe you think what we need is a little more spiritual disciplines in our life. We need to fast more. We need to, uh, we need to have more silent time. We need to have more prayer time. And then we can hold off the stoike on. Or maybe you're one of those hip people and you think what we need is a little new age religion here. We need a few angels in our lives and then we can hold off the stoicheon and Paul essentially says have you lost your mind Christ Jesus has already conquered all the stoicheon and they have no power over you in the world none and then he uses one of the images I like best. He says, let me remind you of what happened at the cross. He says, God took all of our sins and the writings against us and nailed it to the cross. This is actually a great image. Um, a lot of people kind of have a wrong idea about this. There's also a very unusual Greek word in this uh, passage. It's found no place else in uh, the Greek New Testament. We actually have to look pretty hard to find it in other examples to find out what it means. This is what he nails to the cross. Um, in the old days, what they would do is they would take a list of your debts, the stuff you owed, and they would nail it up in the city square. Now, this is a great idea, right? You want your credit card bill nailed up in the city square? And what Paul says is, God takes your list of indebtedness and nails it to the cross, not to the city square, and it is never coming down. Well, that's cool. I used, to, I used to be taught that what he nailed to the cross was the law, but that's not what the text says, and Paul would never say that, by the way. Um, let me see if I can think of an example. Oh, uh, my, uh, my, I have a pretty dodgy driving record. Um, I'm one of the few human beings, particularly men, who's willing to admit that he is a poor driver. I'm not a reckless driver, that's another thing. But I'm a bad driver. There's no question about it. Uh, I, have, I have totaled three cars. And uh, in two of them, I was the only car involved. Um, I think those two were probably my fault. Um, and so, actually, years ago, I'm driving downtown in Nashville, all those one-way streets. I got all turned around. I made a left turn, police car comes up behind me, lights on, policeman comes up, hand him your license. Mr. Harris, do you know you just made a left turn against the red light? No, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. And Mr. Harris, did you know that one of your headlights is out? No, I didn't know that. And Mr. Harris, you're not wearing your seatbelt. I couldn't resist it at that point. I said, yeah, and I'm having a bad hair day too. Yeah. I got three infractions on one stop. And what Paul is saying here is it's not the traffic code get, gets nailed to the cross. What gets nailed to the cross is my list of offenses, which by the way is much better. And it's not coming down. 
And there is nothing you can do in worship, in spiritual disciplines, in philosophy, in theology that will protect you from the stoicheion. The only thing that will conquer the stoicheion is God's work in Jesus Christ, and he has done it. Paul says, there is nothing you can do that will contribute anything to that. Then, what's really interesting is after Paul has said, there is nothing you can do that will contribute anything to that, he spends the last two chapters in Colossians telling you what you should do. What is it with that? Christ has already done it all. What is there to do? Well, uh, Paul scholars use uh, this wonderful phrase to describe this. It is becoming what you are. Okay, let me use another image. One of the great things about, uh, um, about being a, a teacher at a Christian college is I get to perform uh, quite a few weddings. And... Um, for a, uh, a non-Catholic preacher, weddings are one of the few places where we really get to feel our power. Because it's the one time when you can change reality by saying words. I now pronounce you husband and wife. Before I say that, they aren't, and after I say it, they are. I love that moment of power. I always pause before I say it because I want to feel the power. I had one time when this couple took away from me my moment of power. I was getting ready to perform a wedding ceremony that I normally wouldn't have done, but these were people were new at our church. They were kind of on the fringes. I didn't know them very well. I knew the groom, didn't really know the bride at all, didn't know their families. They asked me to marry him. It seemed like the right thing to do. So we get to the wedding day, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to perform the ceremony. And like 30 minutes before the ceremony, I asked the groom, I said, Where, I, I don't think I've signed the marriage license yet. And he says, I need to talk to you about that. I said, okay. So I take him into a side room where it's just him and me, and I said, what's up? And my imagination is just, you know, oh, no, he's got a, another wife in Kansas. <clears throat> and uh, he says, there is no marriage license. I said, tell me about it. He said, we couldn't wait. We eloped a week ago. We're already married. And I think I said something clever like, What? He said, we're already married. He said, is that okay? And I said, sure, can't mess this up. Uh, and I said, who here knows that? And he says, nobody but you. I said, okay. So we go out to do the wedding, and we come to that moment, my moment. And I know when I get ready to say these words that nothing is going to change. And my heart is filled with bitterness. <laughs> and I'm not proud of this, but I decided I would have my moment of revenge. And so I said, I now pronounce you husband and wife, flipped off my microphone, leaned in and whispered to them, still. And they got so tickled they couldn't kiss. <laughs> and so for the whole reception afterwards, people would come up to me and say, what did you say to them? And I said, I'm not saying, ask them. And they spent the whole reception trying to dance around that. But generally speaking, when I say those words, the reality changes. I now pronounce you... Husband and wife. 
I don't know about her, but I do know something about him, and this is what I'm going to tell you. He is going to spend the rest of his life trying to become what I have pronounced him to be because he is clueless. He has no idea what it means to be a husband. But he's fixing to learn. That's becoming what you are. You are set free from sin by Jesus Christ. He has conquered all the dark powers, and we spend the rest of our lives learning to become what he has declared us to be. We live in to this reality. If you're of a certain age, the best image I have for this, you have to be at a, at a precise age. You have to be old enough to remember this, but not so old you can't remember this. If you're at just the right age, you remember the old Lipton tea commercials. Great commercials. Hot, miserable day, sweaty person, and you remember what they do? They fall back into this pool of cool water, and that is the best image I know for Colossians. You let yourself fall back on God's grace. You quit trying so hard to play every note right, thinking God's going to send you to hell if you don't. Instead, what you do is just play along to the beautiful music of God's grace in Jesus Christ because the stoicheon have lost their power over you. And as beautiful as that is when you're playing it in your own room, when you get a lot of people in the same room together playing it, it sounds even better. And so we gather from time to time, usually every week, to play together. To tell each other the story of God nailing our sins and offenses to the cross that are never coming down and to celebrate that the stoicheon may have their little day, but they have no power over us. In James Bryan Smith's stunning words, you are a member of the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is never in trouble. I feel better about life. I teach on the spiritual disciplines. I try to practice them. I go to church a lot. I teach philosophy. I study theology. Those are all useful things. But none of them will conquer the stoicheo. That takes the power of God in Jesus Christ. And so we're rooted and we're grounded in Jesus. What I tell my preaching students is, you can write everything important the Bible says on a note card. The thing about the Bible is it keeps saying those same things in so many interesting ways. But this is the story. God loves you so much that he's conquered the dark powers through Jesus Christ. And you can walk out of here with a light step.